Hello, all you beautiful, majestic people out there, and welcome to my humble little corner of internet real estate. I'm the Sumerian. Today, we're going to be talking about Metroid Dread. Now, Metroid and I go way back. I'm old enough to have actually played the original when it released on the NES. Holy fuck. How do you get so old so fast? Yeah, I'm that old. I played it in all its 8-bit glory back in the day. I also remember getting stuck because every room looked the same, and I didn't have the manual. And back then, manuals were actually useful. It actually helped you get through the game. Remember the old days of manuals? Look how colorful and detailed they were. I miss these. I think kids today miss out on this aspect of the games. I used to sit there and read the manuals and eat my cinnamon toast crunch before school, dreaming of all the adventures that I was going to have with my new game. I remember reading about Samus and how he was going to... Wait a minute. He? Wait, what? Yeah. Remember that reveal? You would only have had that reveal had you owned the manual. Otherwise, the ending wouldn't have had any effect on you. You'd just been like, okay, there's a chick. The manuals literally help tell the story. I'd still read them today if I could, but they don't make them anymore, unfortunately. Not unless you want to pay an extra 50 bucks for a Super Mega Ultra Limited Collector's Edition Mega Box. Ugh. Anyway. Metroid Dread has just released, and it's the first 2D side-scroller that we've seen in 19 years. That's right, it's been 19 years since we've seen Samus in a 2D side-scroller. So when I first heard about this game and that it would be a side-scroller, I nearly lost it. Super Metroid is one of my favorite video games of all time, and Samus is one of my favorite characters of all time, for a couple of reasons. Her cool guns, of course! What were you thinking about? Now, luckily we got Dread because Metroid Prime 4 was delayed indefinitely. And this is what it felt like. But, as much as I hate delays, I'd rather see the game finished correctly with no shortcuts than released early and half-assed. <laughs> so, this begs the question, was Metroid Dread worth the wait? We'll stick around and find out. In Metroid Dread, you assume the role of beloved fan favorite Samus Aran. The story picks up immediately following the events that have taken place in Metroid Fusion. If you don't have a Game Boy Advance, you can check that out via an emulator if you care to start on the storyline that predates Metroid Dread. And if you really care to get to the point before Fusion, you can play Metroid Other M on the Wii that came out after Fusion, but takes place before. Gotta love Nintendo timelines. Anyway. It certainly isn't necessary, but I did, and it was a nice precursor to playing Dread. It does, however, work as its own standalone story. With all the Metroids exterminated, the only Metroid DNA left is in Samus, as a result of the vaccine she was given in Metroid Fusion. In Metroid Dread, Samus learns that the X-Parasite is not eradicated, but a single X was filmed alive and well on a planet known as ZDR. Samus and her trusty AI companion Adam learn this information via a mysterious message transmitted from an unknown sender. With the uncontrollable and extremely dangerous nature of the X-Parasite, it could potentially usher in the end of biological life in the universe. The Galactic Federation then proceeded to send seven AMI robots, which are highly capable research robots. However, soon after, all radio contact with the Emmys is lost. So Samus, under orders from the Galactic Federation, plots her course for ZDR and proceeds to investigate the sighting and the communication breakdown between the Emmy team. In Metroid Dread, the action is brought back gloriously in 2D side-scrolling fashion. Samus has never looked so good and moved so fluidly. Throughout the game, you'll run the gamut of acquiring all the abilities we've all come to know and love throughout the franchise, albeit in an unfamiliar order. You do get certain abilities long after you would typically expect. The Morph Ball, for instance, you don't get for quite some time. Which isn't a bad thing, but we've all come to know you know, a certain style of play from the Metroid series, so it does kind of throw you off a bit. You start off with your abilities having been conveniently siphoned via an Egyptian bird-like attacker in the first instance of the game. There are many themes of Egyptian mythology and culture throughout the game, but we'll get to that later. She can now shoot her power beam in any direction via holding the L1 button, and it works really smoothly. She can also shoot whilst climbing and attach to overhead spider magnet surfaces, this makes it easy to defend yourself from flying enemies. She also has a nice little slide that she can utilize while running to maneuver under crevices. Typical to like an old school Mega Man X slide. 
This is smoothly done and it controls well and it feels very fluid for the most part. But I found that, I don't know if it's my controller or the game itself, but I'm inclined to believe it's the game as this is a brand new Switch. So drift shouldn't be an issue yet on the Joy-Con, but the double jump feels stiff and it often doesn't proc when needed. Again, I'm not sure if this is the game or if this is the controller. Also, while I love the analog for multi-directional fluid aiming, it doesn't seem to translate well to 2D controlled moves such as Samus's Shine Star, as it's difficult to hit directly down all the time while you're moving and using the analog. This would be a lot easier if you had a directional pad. This makes it pretty frustrating to do that all-important item collection when you're 100%ing the game. Again, it just doesn't seem to translate well to a few of her moves. I think I trade the great aiming for the directional movement instead. She also has abilities called Ion Abilities, which utilize her Ion Gauge, which recharges over time. You get multiple Ion Abilities, but the first one you get is the Shadow Cloak Ability, which allows you to avoid the corrupted Emmy robots that are now trying to kill you. And here we are at the first issue that I'm sure many others will complain about. The Emmys, yes, these robot instances you get into that happen often, and just like the lame award show on TV is just as insufferable and annoying. Now, these instances I didn't find fun or interested in even the first time, or the 50th time, or the 100th time. And they always seem to occur right after you get a new ability. So yay, I get the morph ball, finally, I'm gonna go roll around and have a bit of fun. Oh wait. Here comes the Fun Police, aka the Emmys, for another timed action sequence. Ugh. I hate timed action sequences in video games. I think it's cheap, and it just doesn't work. It just, it, it, it doesn't do it for me, it never has, and it never will. So, yeah, I pretty much loathe this aspect of the game. It broke the immersion and the flow of the game for me. Maybe some people liked it, but I hated it. And I've always hated action and uh, time action sequences in, in any video game. I've never liked this type of game mechanic. So you can't just kill them. You end up just running around and often it's towards shrouded areas on the map that often lead to dead ends. So you can just watch yourself getting killed by these monstrosities over and over again. Unless you have like meth head like reaction times and you can escape it during the timed action sequence. The window is insanely small. I will say that after a while I did find myself doing it almost at will and escaping them, but man, the first 50 times, it is irritating. I bitch about this solely because at the beginning of the game, this happens pretty often. The only way you can kill these is to fight a little mini boss, it's like an eyeball machine, and you absorb its power and then you use your Omega Cannon to initiate yet another instance where the Emmy will, for whatever reason this time, slow down to a crawl to approach you while you blast its face and then blow its head off with your charged Omega Cannon. Now why do they move slowly for you to conveniently aim at their head and manually shoot at them so you can blow off their armor so then you can use your Omega Cannon to charge up and blow their head off? Who knows? After you kill them you'll gain another ability usually and then you'll proceed with your mission after that. Now this issue tapers off towards the end so I have to be fair. Because once they're dead, they are free from the zone, and then you can explore it as you see fit. So it does get better. One thing I did notice is that there are a ton of cutscenes in this game. And the Emmy sequences. Now, I don't mind cutscenes if they're like an important story element, but there's so many of them. You can skip them, but a lot of this just disrupts the flow of the game for me. Cutscenes to me should be used sparingly. They typically disrupt my immersion in the game and the flow of things generally. Key story elements, you know, sure, that's fine for cutscenes, but they went a little overboard, I think, here. The boss fights in this game are pretty amazing and they're often quite challenging. The bosses have numerous abilities and movesets to keep you on your toes and keep you guessing and they are just difficult enough to keep you frustrated, but they do well to keep you wanting to emerge victorious and proceed forward. So the boss fights for the most part are incredibly well done and entertaining, but they kind of become repetitive towards the end as they are often the same enemies over and over again. It just seems like they phoned in the end of the game to me. The bosses have multiple phases and there are windows available to counterattack. Similar to the Emmy encounters, most enemies have counterattack weak point triggers that Samus can exploit if timed correctly. Although this isn't necessary for most bosses, it does add a different dynamic to the combat. 
Per the usual, Samus will get multiple suit and weapon upgrades as well as iron up upgrades throughout the game. A lot of these look fantastic and the weapon upgrades are especially interesting, offering a lot of variety and utility throughout the game. The screw attack is a little OP as it essentially renders your weapon useless. It takes upwards of 10 missiles to kill certain enemies, but one or two screw attack jumps and they're dead. So it's a little unbalanced. I rarely, if ever, used my plasma gun as it became useless once you acquired the screw attack ability, unless you're fighting a boss. Overall, the gameplay is done well and it has fluid and smooth controls. It offers great challenges throughout the game and interesting boss encounters. The bosses themselves and the art design is really well done as well. The abilities and upgrades are particularly well done in Metroid Dread. Now, the map. There are tons of locations in Metroid Dread. They're sprawling, huge, and they're very confusing to navigate at times. This isn't necessarily a bad thing, but a lot of your time will be spent scrutinizing the map for exits and entrances, as there are often one-way entrances to areas, forcing you to backtrack often. The areas are well detailed and beautifully done for the most part, but some just felt generic to me. The ocean level and the Egyptian levels had amazing levels of detail, however. These being my favorite areas, and Gravorin. Gravorin and Berenia, however you pronounce it, both of those areas are fantastic. Throughout each area you'll have multiple avenues of transportation. This comes in the form of teleports, trams, and elevators. The travel times between each area are pretty long but tolerable. They do make sense though within the context of what Samus is doing. Riding tram sequences and elevators makes sense, so I don't have a huge gripe with that. After all, Samus does have to ride trams and elevators to get to each area, so I don't have a huge gripe with that. It does make sense within the context of the game. You do have an option to place map markers, but given the confusing layouts of each area, the tunnels and pitfalls, they don't really help much. You'll be glued to the maps of each area for sure. There are a ton of secret areas, trick spots, and multiple items to collect via traditional Metroid fashion requiring you to get creative and utilize Samus' abilities in unique ways. Something the game does excel at, at these areas can be very challenging. And some of the tricks that you're required to perform to get some of the power-ups for 100%, they are pretty challenging, so you'll have a lot of time in your hands to, to play around with that kind of stuff. The graphics in Metroid Dread look great, and Samus looks amazing in this installment. Better than she's ever looked, really. It's great to see her in a side-scroller after so long of a hiatus. I mean, 19 years we haven't seen her in this fashion. The different suits you get will look amazing and they're all very well detailed and bright. The game has a very pleasing polish and aesthetic to it. It really looks gorgeous as there's a ton of detail in the backgrounds especially. From background animals to environmental effects, the game looks beautiful and it's very immersive for a side-scroller. There's constantly things moving around in the background and the foreground and the environments really do feel alive. The shadows and textures of the enemies and Samus are brilliant, and the overall art design of the enemies is fantastic. The boss designs are especially well done and very detailed, especially Kraid. Incredible looking on the Switch. Bright, grotesque, and vibrant colors. The animations you'll see through each enemy phase are well done and very detailed. When things explode, they look amazing and the enemies have cool effects and animations. The lighting and the fire and ice levels are exceptional as I found these to be some of the most interesting looking levels. The ocean level is still my favorite art design piece though. The physics of Samus moving is especially well done, especially underwater. Her momentum and her jumping, they all seem to be very fluid and it seems realistic. The fish swimming and move as you would expect and Samus is considerably slower in water. Graphically it runs at a steady 60 FPS for the most part at 1600 by 900 resolution. The only time I noticed any stuttering was when there was multiple enemies or effects on the screen. However, this was pretty rare. The cutscenes do look nice, and a lot of the graphics are really nice in the cutscenes, but they are capped at 30 FPS, which isn't a big deal. The portable mode runs at 720p, and I have to say, it does look pretty incredible. I found myself rather enjoying it on the bright and vibrant OLED model and the bigger screen. Overall, the game is quite beautiful and what I think would be expected by the franchise. The sound effects of Samus' weapons are very well done. Whichever version of the blaster you're using will sound meaty and heavy as you would hope. The controller vibrates while using the charge beam and it really gives you the feeling of firing powerful weapons. 
The sound effects of the enemies, the groans and the roars of each enemy, they're all highly refined and they stand out individually. Almost every ability that you have has a unique sound attached to it. The mid-air dash, the grappling beam, the power bomb has an especially amazing sound and overall effect. It literally feels like you're dropping mini nukes and laying waste to the environment. Even the environment explodes when you drop some power bombs. It's kick ass. The missiles also sound fantastic and they sound heavy. All the weapons and abilities have highly detailed sound effects. The ice missiles in particular have a great sound effect. The cracking and the freezing at the same time. I loved this sound effect. It was really well done. Certain enemies have lightning covering them and you can hear the sound of the lightning crackling and popping as it engulfs them. The sound effects are brilliant and they're highly polished and well thought out. There's tons of tracks in this game and for the most part they ramp up appropriately and they're pretty atmospheric and well composed. They suit each area well, but there aren't many standout tracks that made me really stop and appreciate them, besides Barinia. I think it's not only the best music and sound in the game, but it's the best overall design. This area is truly brilliantly done. And some fusion nostalgia as well, but overall the OST was a bit of a letdown for me. The Metroid theme, however, is absolutely amazing on Metroid Dread. I think it's my favorite version of the track, and the title screen music is gorgeous as well. The next most memorable area that stood out to me was Gravoran. It's got amazing music and it's incredibly atmospheric. The least favorite areas are the Emmy areas. They sound generic and they're annoying as hell to me. It really started to grate on my ears after a while. Especially the search and destroy music and the, the sound effects. It just got annoying. I just hate those areas in general. Overall, the music is good, but it felt uninspired for a lot of the tracks. Nothing besides Samus's theme and the main title theme, Barinia and Gravoran, nothing besides those tracks really stood out to me. Nothing really struck a chord with me. Great music is supposed to do that, and I didn't really feel that at all. I listened to the complete OST for Fusion and Super Metroid, and Dread, just for comparison, there's so many standout tracks on the other games, but there's not too many. I did like the, uh, the rendition of the item acquisition fanfare. It's nicely done. That's refreshing to hear as well as Samus's arrival theme. It's always a great joy to hear that. It really did sound awesome in Dread. But oddly enough, I actually think Fusion's OST did a better job of invoking a feeling of dread than, well, Dread did. Dread felt more like an action cyber attack game more than anything to me. I don't really recall getting any feelings of dread while I was playing it. Besides the Emmy areas, but that's not dreadful because they're scary. Dreadful because they were annoying. Anyways, moving on. I suppose I was expecting it to be more dark and nightmarish and disturbing. I'm not sure what it is, but it just didn't hit the mark for me. I think Fusion's OST was a lot stronger. As far as technical issues go, there's not much to speak of here. It runs pretty smoothly and it seems to hold a steady FPS besides the slowdown effects that I mentioned earlier. Sometimes the double jump seems to be difficult to trigger at times, but other than that, the game runs pretty great. Minor graphical glitches during loading screens, but that's largely irrelevant. Metroid Dread is a solid game and a good addition to the series, but I don't think it's the holy grail that Metroid fans were waiting for especially after waiting 19 years for Samus to make her return to the side-scrolling genre. It just seems like Metroid Dread missed the mark, especially towards the end of it. It is rather anticlimactic and a bit phoned in with repeating bosses and a lack of a musical punch. I played it for 13 hours, and that was 70% completion for items, but the first few hours were rather annoying due to the Emmy sequences and the zones. Maybe these zones and style of gameplay works for some, but for me it became tiresome and annoying. I love the overall difficulty of the game and the multiple phases and challenges the bosses and zones offer, but these zones were not annoying due to difficulty. They were just annoying in general. In conclusion, it's a good game with great graphics, awesome side-scrolling gameplay minus the Emmy and action sequences, nice level design minus the one-way entrances that do become tedious while you're exploring. It runs technically pretty well and it looks great at solid FPS, but the whole thing just fell a bit short for me. And the story. Well, I was underwhelmed to say the least. It wasn't fantastic. It was okay. But given all the time that they had, I would have thought that they would have come up with some kind of a masterpiece of storytelling. And this ain't it. Hopefully we won't have to wait another 19 years for a side-scroller Metroid entry. But perhaps we'll see another first-person entry like the Prime series. Only time will tell, and I'm hopeful to see where the Metroid series goes after this. Well, that's going to do it for this one, guys. 
Thanks for sticking around, and I hope to see you in the next one. Take care of yourselves and each other.